Imagine we take an image and add a bit of Gaussian noise to it, then do this again. If we repeat this enough times, eventually we'll have an unrecognizable picture of static, a sample of pure noise. Now, what if we could figure out how to undo this process? That is, start from a noise image, gradually remove the noise, and end up with a coherent image. This is the basic idea behind diffusion models, an approach gaining traction in generative modeling. They've had success particularly in the domain of image generation, and they are starting to rival, and in some cases surpass, other kinds of generative models you may be familiar with on certain tasks. For example, recent diffusion models have outperformed generative adversarial networks, known as GANs, in perceptual quality metrics. And they've also shown impressive performance in various conditional settings, such as converting text descriptions to images, in painting, and manipulation. In this video, we'll try to understand the basic mechanism behind diffusion models and how they can be adapted to different generative settings. We'll start with a sample from some target data distribution, like an image from a training set. Let's call this X0. Now, let's define a forward diffusion process that gradually adds noise to the image over big T time steps. Our model will be tasked with starting at X big T and undoing this noise through what we'll call the reverse process. The forward process, which we'll denote with Q, takes the form of a Markov chain, where the distribution at a particular time step only depends on the sample from the immediately previous step. So we can write out the distribution of corrupted samples conditioned on the initial data point, x0, as the product of successive single-step conditionals. In the case of continuous data, each transition is parameterized as a diagonal Gaussian. Beta t here is the variance at a particular time step t. Typically, these variances are treated as hyperparameters and follow a fixed schedule for a particular training run. Beta generally increases with time and is restricted to be between 0 and 1, meaning that this coefficient, radical 1 minus beta t, will likewise be non-zero, but less than 1, bringing the mean of each new Gaussian closer to zero. In the limit, as t approaches infinity, q will approach a Gaussian centered at zero with identity covariance, losing all information about the original sample. In practice, the total number of steps, big T, is on the order of a thousand. Using a large, albeit finite, number of steps allows us to set the individual variances, beta t, to be very small, while still approximately maintaining the same limiting distribution. But why do we want to use a small step size? What's the benefit? Well, it means that learning to undo the steps of the forward process won't be too difficult. Let's consider a simple case in one dimension. Suppose we were given the distribution of a forward process sample at time t minus 1, and it resembled a mixture of Gaussians with two modes. We then observe xt, and want to infer the posterior distribution over x t minus 1. That is, we'd like to determine where did the chain likely come from in order to arrive at x t. What was the previous step of the chain? If the noise step, that is, q of x t given x t minus 1, is allowed to be large, then we will be quite uncertain about the location of x t minus 1. Who knows where we jumped from? But if the forward noise step is restricted to be small, there is much less ambiguity about x t minus 1. We could then be justified in modeling the posterior of the forward step, that is, q of x t minus 1 given x t, with a unimodal Gaussian, eliminating the contribution from the mode to the right. And in fact, it can be shown theoretically that in the limit of infinitesimal step sizes, the true reverse process will have the same functional form as the forward process. So diffusion models leverage this observation, parameterizing each learned reverse step to also be a unimodal diagonal Gaussian. Aside from the sample at time t, the model also takes t as input in order to account for the forward process variance schedule. Different time steps are associated with different noise levels, and the model can learn to undo these individually. Like the forward process, the reverse process is set up as a Markov chain and we can write out the joint probability of a sequence of samples as a product of conditionals and the marginal probability of x big T. So what is p of x big T here exactly? Well, it's the same as q of x big T, 
the pure noise distribution. So at infant's time, in order to actually generate a sample, we start from a Gaussian and begin sampling from the learned individual steps of the reverse process, p of xt minus 1 given xt, until producing an x0. Okay, great. So we've defined these forward and reverse diffusion processes. The forward process is designed to essentially push a sample off the data manifold, turning it into noise, and the reverse process is trained to produce a trajectory back to the data manifold, resulting in a reasonable sample. But what objective will we actually be optimizing? Is it some maximum likelihood objective where we directly maximize the density assigned to x0 by the model? Well, not exactly. If we try to calculate p of x0, we see that we have to marginalize over all the possible trajectories, all the ways we could have arrived at x0 when starting from a noise sample. This, unfortunately, is intractable. But it turns out we can maximize a lower bound. To do this, let's view x1 through x big T as latent variables and x0 as an observed variable, allowing us to interpret a diffusion model as a kind of latent variable generative model. If we think back to another latent variable model you may be familiar with, variational autoencoders, commonly known as VAEs, we might get a hint about our training objective. As a quick reminder, in a VAE, we have an encoder that produces a distribution over latent Z given a data input X, and a decoder that reconstructs the data by producing a distribution over data X given a latent input Z. So we can think of the forward process in diffusion models as analogous to the encoder, producing latents from data, and the reverse process as analogous to the decoder, producing data from latents. Now, unlike a VAE encoder, the forward process here is typically fixed. It's the reverse process that we focus solely on learning. This means that only a single network needs to be trained, unlike in a VAE where two networks are trained jointly. So we can now borrow the basic training objective used by VAEs and a number of other latent variable models. When we have a model with observations x and latent variable z, we can derive what's called the variational lower bound, also known as the evidence lower bound a lower bound on the marginal log likelihood, p theta of x. We won't walk through the full derivation here, but the end result is a likelihood term, also known as a reconstruction term, subtracted by a KL divergence term. The likelihood term encourages the model to maximize the expected density assigned to the data, while the KL divergence encourages the approximate posterior, q z given x, to be similar to the prior on the latent variable, p of z. As we saw earlier, x0 will serve as the observation in the diffusion model framework, while x1 through big T will take the place of the latent variable z here. Let's substitute these in. All right, now let's simplify a bit. We can expand the KL divergence to combine the two terms into a single expectation. And finally, we can refactor the chain probabilities into their individual steps. Now, there's a nice property of the forward process Q that we didn't touch on earlier. Any arbitrary step of the forward process can be sampled directly in closed form. This is just because the sum of independent Gaussian steps is still a Gaussian. So at training time, any term of this objective can be obtained without having to simulate an entire chain. Likewise, we can optimize this objective by randomly sampling pairs of xt minus 1 and xt and maximizing the conditional density assigned by the reverse step to xt minus 1. However, because different trajectories may visit different samples at time t minus 1 on the way to hitting xt, this setup can have high variance, limiting training efficiency. To help with this, we can rearrange the objective as follows. Let's examine each component. P of x big T is fixed. It's just the start of the reverse process, the pure noise distribution. And as we saw earlier, the whole forward process Q is also treated as fixed. So we just have to worry about these two terms to the right. Here we have a sum of KL divergences, each between a reverse step and a forward process posterior conditioned on x0. One can prove, with Bayes' rule, that when we treat the original sample x0 as known, 
like it is during training, these Q terms are actually just Gaussians. Since the reverse step is already parameterized as a Gaussian, each KL divergence now is simply comparing two Gaussians and can be evaluated in closed form. This helps reduce variance in the training process because instead of aiming to reconstruct Monte Carlo samples, the targets for the reverse step become the true posteriors of the forward process, given x0. There are a couple different ways we could imagine implementing the reverse step, p theta. In the paper Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Models, DDPM for short, the authors elect to set the reverse process variances to time-specific constants, as they found learning them led to unstable training and lower quality samples. So the reverse step network is solely tasked with learning the means. They then suggest a reparameterization that aims to have the network predict the noise that was added rather than the Gaussian mean. First, we can rewrite sampling from an arbitrary forward step by using an auxiliary noise variable, epsilon. Epsilon here has a constant distribution, independent of the forward time step t. And the reverse step model can be designed to simply predict this epsilon. The authors also found that a simpler version of the variational bound that discards the term weights that appear in the original bound led to better sample quality. So compared to the original variational lower bound, their objective downweight steps that have very small noise at early time steps of the forward process, allowing training to focus on more challenging, greater noise steps. Like other generative frameworks, diffusion models can be made to sample conditionally given some variable of interest like a class label or a sentence description. One way to do this is to just feed the conditioning variable y as an additional input during training. In theory, the model should learn to use y as a helpful hint about what it should be reconstructing. In practice, some work has shown that further guiding the diffusion process with a separate classifier can help. In this setup, we take a trained classifier and push the reverse diffusion process in the direction of the gradient of the target label probability with respect to the current noise image. And we can do this not just with single word labels, but also with higher dimensional text descriptions as well. Of course, one drawback of this technique is the reliance upon a second network. An alternative approach eliminates this reliance, instead using special training of the diffusion model itself to guide the sampling. In the paper Classifier-Free Diffusion Guidance, the conditioning label Y is set to a null label with some probability during training. Then, at inference time, the reconstructed samples are artificially pushed further towards the Y conditional direction and away from the null label. Even though no new information is being given to the model, they found this to produce higher quality samples under human evaluation compared to classifier guidance. Inpainting is another conditional generation problem where diffusion models have had success. The naive way to perform inpainting with diffusion models is to take a model trained in the standard way and at inference time, replace known regions of an image with a sample from the forward process after each reverse step. Now, this works okay, but can lead to edge artifacts. The model is not being made aware of the full surrounding context, only a hazy version of it. Instead, better results come from fine-tuning a model specifically for this task. We can randomly remove sections of training images and have the model attempt to fill them in, conditioned on the full, clear context. We can compare diffusion models to some other prominent deep generative models. For sampling tasks, diffusion models are somewhat limited by the slow Markov chain. This contrasts, for example, with GANs, which can generate images in a single forward pass. Ongoing work aims to speed up sampling in diffusion models. As we saw earlier, diffusion models allow us to calculate a variational lower bound on the log likelihood, similar to VAEs. In practice, this lower bound can be quite good and even competitive on density estimation benchmarks, which have long been dominated by autoregressive models. Going beyond lower bounds, a continuous time formulation of diffusion models can give rise to what's called a probability flow ODE. This enables approximating log likelihood via numerical integration. There's a close connection between denoising diffusion models and what are called score matching models. And often, these are now grouped together into a single class of models. Score here refers to the gradient of the log of the target probability density with respect to the data. A score network is trained to estimate this value. Then, a Markov chain is set up to actually produce samples from the learned distribution, 
guided by this gradient? Well, it turns out the score can actually be shown to be equivalent to the noise that's predicted in the denoising diffusion objective, up to a scaling factor. So we can think of undoing the noise in a diffusion model approximately as trying to follow the gradient of the data log density. Diffusion models are really gaining momentum, and it's been exciting to see their progress. Check out the links in the description to learn more. Thanks for watching.